And joining me now is Sean Emmett, and Sean's here to give me a hand welcoming our very next guest. I'm so pleased to present him. Uh, he's a member of the Order of Canada, and uh, you probably know him best for climbing out of a log over nine, about 900 times or so, over 12 seasons on TV. Fred Penner is here. Fred, thanks so much for uh, taking some time out and coming down to join That's us. That's an odd description, a man who crawled out of a log 900 times. What kind of a warped person would do that? Yeah, well, I had to say on TV, because that's the stat I kind of found on, is that you did almost 900 episodes. How many times do you think you crawled out of the log overall, including live shows and everything? Oh, well, well we, we never had it in the live series. The okay. live performance was not a log time. It was only on the TV series. So, you know, with, with rehearsals and the rest of it, probably <clears throat> five, 6,000 times? I don't know. Wow. A lot. Back problems? <laughs> My knees are just starting to heal. Right on. Well, you're in town uh, today uh, because you got a show tonight happening at the Gateway up at SAIT. Mm, uh, doors open at do. 8 o'clock. Uh, tickets available at Ticketmaster. Uh, Sean, how much were they? I think they were fifteen dollars at yeah. Ticketmaster, twelve fifty on Ticketmaster, fifteen at the door. Excellent. Cheap now, at twice the price. Yeah. Now the gate is a uh, a licensed establishment, so you're not going to get uh, much audience under the age of eighteen. There. Tell me about a bit about the show that's happening tonight. Uh, it's well. Well, Sean knows about it. He saw it a couple of years ago. We played Saint as well. Uh, it's an interesting perspective that's happened over the last the last seven, eight years, because the generation who grew up with Fred Penner's place, with the, the guy in the log, are now the young adults, 20 mm -hmm. to 30, 35. And uh, so I've been going back playing campuses from Vancouver to Prince Edward Island over the last while. And, uh, and often the audience will ask for the same songs that they grew up with. So the, the Cat Came Back and uh, a tune called Sandwiches, and there's a whole variety of songs that I that I sang and, and do normally in my family concerts that they were requesting, but I spiced that up a little bit with some uh, new tunes, some uh, contemporary songs, some tunes that I grew up with back in the in the folk days, some uh, maybe Joni Mitchell or Cat Stevens, songs that were an influence for me back in those days. So we have a, a good variety and lots of audience participation and interaction. It's a, it's a fun night, I think. And for people, since I've been there, I can say people can't, might not be able to picture, but this is people 18, I think I saw f people in their 50s there, sure. sitting on the floor, cross-legged, <laughs> listening to you, and you stayed in character the entire time, too. It was like you were singing to, you know, people under 10. Is that hard to do? Well, my, my character, I, I, don't, I don't assume anything, anything different than what you're seeing right now, the, the old what you see is what you get thing. But I, I, I don't condescend to, to my audience, you know, uh, certainly to children. And when I'm in, a, in a, an atmosphere with adults, it's it gets a little bit more intellectual in my in my brain, and and so I'll, I'll dip into some rants along the way about things that I'm concerned about. But um, so it's not maintaining the character at all. It's just maintaining, I guess, more contact with the audience. So I, I I've always thought that I come from an acting background as well. So as soon as I get on stage, that's when the interaction begins. When I step off the stage, then it moves from there to the autograph table. But it's it's a constant communication level, dialogue, interaction with the audience, and I, I don't lose that. I don't I don't sort of when I'm on stage, I don't drift off into uh, um, just another zone where where I'm not connected. I'm always looking at the audience. Now you've played a, a ton of these shows before, and Sean was just saying that, that people come down and they sit on the floor, cross-legged in front of you. Is that something that happens all the time at these? Or? No, not always. As, as I, I recall, there was that space available. Okay. And uh, and, and I, I think I said, uh, okay, it's story time, just for, for fun. <laughs> and, and there was this roar that came up from the audience, and suddenly people sort of came forward and sat in front. So th there was a group, maybe it was your group, Sean, I don't know, who, who sort of initiated that. And they that feeling of getting into a a zone that they hadn't been for a long time was the uh, was the really interesting part of this um, of, of this performance they, they they wanted to re experience the kind of energy that I brought to the table when they were when they were younger 
It was very neat. Yeah, very cool. That's I just think that's kind of neat. I can almost see it. You know, a bunch of twenty-five year old. <laughs> I was twenty-four. For the rest 20 of I was young. Yeah, don't exaggerate. Now, do you find that the responses from your audience? Like, do you find some of the messages that you you gave to kids growing up coming back to you from your audience when you get to chat with them, doing the autograph sessions and stuff afterwards? Yeah, the, I mean, you never know what kind of communication is ultimately going to happen when you uh, when you begin performing. The messages that I've have always been part of it is the the value of communication, the importance of home, the importance of family, the importance of communication with each other, uh, and and what tends to happen is people will come to me and say, "I am going into education because of you. I'm going into uh, I'm into music. I play guitar because of you." So whatever little piece of of my energy that was in the TV series or, or, on, uh, or in, in live concert seemed to have made a, some kind of impact on the, uh, on the young impressionable mind and so they, they come back with, with a very positive I, I guess po positivity is sort of the key to what I do and so they come back to me with that kind of buoyancy and, and desire to communicate and that, that's as good as it can get. Awesome. And so for a children's entertainer, a lot of them, like you look at the Wiggles, they started off as a rock band and then decided yeah. to do children. But for you, from what we've learned, is from <laughs> four years old, it says you're singing on the bus and you taught yourself to play guitar. So That's it's almost right. like you were meant to, to be a children's well, entertainer right it, from the get-go. It's certainly a, a performer because I, I, I did start, you know, I was surrounded by a wonderful world of music from my parents, you know, from classical music to the swing era of the 40s to my brother and sister who went to the, the early boy bands and the rock and the Elvis Presley and, and then the folk scene for me. So I've got this beautiful package of music that I draw upon in my, my personal energy. Playing the folk, folk scene in the 70s was, uh, was a critical part of my development, doing the acting thing in the 70s. Uh, so I, I bring to the table a, a, a complexity, I think, to my personal energy that relates to the child, that relates to the parent and the grandparent. So it's all part of one one big package. I I think I was destined to be a, a performer first and foremost, and fortunately it did channel into working with younger children who are now keeping me on the road. Thank you very much. But that wasn't necessarily the start. So you didn't start out going, I'm going to be a children's entertainer. No. No. Okay. So it was the start of, you know, I'm going to be a musician or an artist of some type, and it just kind of morphed into that children's yeah, entertainment. Yeah, there was a, a strong, uh, well, I, I, I went through economics and psychology at university to live out my father's dream to, to go through, you know, to, to have a degree. Mm -hmm. My father passed away in the early 70s, and my sister, younger sister Susie, who was a Down syndrome child, she died a year before. And, uh, and that, those two mortality hits were what turned the course of my life, ultimately. And, and so I, I decided to, I didn't want to follow the economic <laughs> journey at all. And the only thing that I had done in my life that gave me a sense of, of real accomplishment and positivity was performing. Was, was doing the, 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 the folk clubs and, and doing some acting things and the musical comedy. So I, I started playing a lounge and bar circuit that led to a, a friend of mine, Al Simmons, who you may be aware of. And Al and I formed a band and we, we toured across the country for four or five years. And then that led to working with my, uh, my future wife, who was a, a choreographer. And she came to Winnipeg and had a vision for starting a children's dance theater company. So I wrote music, she choreographed, we performed for children, and that led to an offer to do the Cat Game back in 1979. So it's all these, these sort of benchmarks along the way that, that sort of pick you up and keep you moving in, uh, in some kind of a path, and you have to be open for it. Now you always had a, a message um, for kids as you were doing the show, very positive, very strong message. Um, what's your opinion on children's television today and sort of where it's gone from that? I've got some young boys, very young, they're watching it and it seems to me that pretty much every single thing they watch, I can buy some type of product that goes mm. with this. A t-shirt, a lunchbox, a something. As long as, I mean, they're still learning, but it doesn't seem to me maybe as wholesome as it used to be. I, I concur. To that, now, I'm I'm a little disappointed with where it's gone, because in the I mean in my generation, uh, I grew up with with real human beings connecting with with me through through the television through the radio, <clears throat> excuse me, 
And, uh, and when I came on the air, there was uh, Mr. Dressup was still on, The Friendly Giant had just finished, but it was all about humans sharing their energy, their, their songs, their stories with, with the children. So there was something that I think the kids could really identify with. Mm -hmm. And now it's, it's, uh, it's all puppet, it's all cartoon, it's all computer generated animation. It's all, in my mind, a lot of condescension. Mm -hmm. To you know, not giving the child the ability to to make up their minds about something, to think you know positively about anything, yeah. it's uh, it, it's it's not pleasant in my in my perspective. But uh, what do I know? Yeah. Uh, well, you've kind of done this for a long, <laughs> long time, so uh, you know you're a bit of an expert on the subject of entertaining kids. So uh, I, I I tend to agree a bit with that. It kind of seems to have gone that way for me too. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned those iconic shows that you know people my age and even Mark's age uh, watched growing up, oh, like yeah. Mr. Dressup. And you actually yeah. got your start before Penner, Fred Penner's Place was on Sharon Lois and Bram, the Elephant Show. Sure. I, I was touring for uh, in the family children direction from 1979 to 85, working with Rafi, uh, doing performances in his sh his shows, doing festivals across the country, and those shows led to uh, the offer to do the first uh, the first. Well, the TV series in 1985. And just a phone call out of the blue from CBC. You know, do you want to do this? Well, sure. How? Think about it. I came up with the log concept. The whole idea of the series was uh, was mine, and uh, and it it worked, it worked pretty well for 13 years. Yeah, long time. It yeah. went on 900 episodes yeah, or so. Right. So yeah, very cool. And they always play the episode before you come out on stage too. Like when when I saw you. Yeah, I I've got ago. that I've got that little it's in the car, but but I've got the opening segment which I'm hoping we can uh, throw out tonight as well. All right, well, uh, you brought your guitar. I did. We, we have a little rule here at uh, Sun Country that uh, anybody who comes in with an instrument, we make them play. So yeah. uh, there we go. So uh, what, what can you play for us I'm gonna, today? I, well, as we were talking, and I mentioned my, uh, my sister Susie, who was a Down Syndrome child, and I've been you know, so, so involved with, uh, with the Down Syndrome Society for the last, well, for, for many years. I've, uh, I've been, I performed it there. Uh, their conferences across the country, and in Ottawa, in uh, a few years ago, there was a, a Down syndrome conference that I, I performed at. And the conference was called Celebrate Being, and uh, we've already talked about the uh, about the flood world here, but but this celebration of of who you are and what you've gone through is sort of part of this song as well here. So I wrote the song Celebrate Being. Celebrate being a dreamer, celebrate being real, celebrate being good, good friends, telling each other how you feel. Celebrate being happy, celebrate being proud, celebrate being effervescent, shouting your name out loud. I like your style cause you make me smile Celebrate being gentle Celebrate being kind Celebrate being filled with love And letting your love light shine Everyone is welcome We are people first And there's no denying We'll keep on trying It turns out better when we're together I like your style Smile, celebrate being gentle, celebrate being kind, celebrate being filled with love and letting your love light shine. Yeah, celebrate being filled with love and letting your love light shine, letting your love light shine. Fred Petter on 99.7 Sun Country. Thanks, Fred. That was awesome. Great <laughs> tune. Great Thank tune. You. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about, uh, in 1991, you got made a uh, member of the Order of Canada. Yeah. Uh, tell us a little bit about that honor. Um, it, it was humbling to, to, the, uh, to the max. 
uh, I had uh, I had gone there with my mother in 19 actually it was 1992, and um, and I was in the in the midst of of of, of doctors who had 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 solved cancer problems. Uh, Norman Jewison was there receiving uh, his next level, the companion. It it was uh, it was. Insane! It was such a, a wonderful day, a wonderful experience. I was uh, delighted to share that with my mother. But when you when you're in that kind of an atmosphere, uh, w with so many truly great people, you you all you feel everybody felt the same way as, what am I doing here? This I don't deserve this. There's so many people who have really made a difference in this world. But but I certainly was uh, you know honored to be part of that uh, of that company. So uh, getting that recognition was something that. Well, because you, you never you don't do that as a performer. I don't think anybody does that for the recognition. You do it because it's in you. Because you have to create. You have to share. You have to build your your world as best you can. All right. Well, uh, we've got a little bit of something special happening here today. It uh, is uh, one of our guys. One of the guys oh, here in our newsroom. Go. It's his birthday. Oh. And it's not every day oh, that on your birthday you get to have Fred Penner. Dan Bascombe's birthday, here it is. <laughs> All right, thanks so much and for coming in. And he blew the in. candle, nicely done. Fred, thanks so much for coming in, spending <laughs> some time with us today, man. It's been a great time. Thank you.